I want to start with kind of two humbling experiences for me. And uh, Carl just told you about one. The first one is very long term. And I see a couple of colleagues in the audience. For uh, almost 40 years, I worked at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, as Carl said. And I worked with some very, very creative people. I was not a visual artist. Now that's humbling. 38 years of humbling, trust me, okay? And the other is a much more recent experience. And please, do not blame Tess O'Connor for this, okay? Uh, I got this call from Tess, and she said, uh, I work with something called Creative Mornings, and we'd like you to come and talk about humility. I'm going, oh, humility, okay. Uh, so we had a couple of meetings, and at one of the meetings, I had kind of a sketchy, very sketchy outline of things I wanted to talk about. And Tess very nicely read my outline. And then she sort of pushes it back to me and says, well, Ruth, you know, maybe you could make it a little more personal and a, a, a little less luxury. Uh, so, uh, but I spent 38 years lecturing and I haven't had a lecture in a semester and a half, okay? <laughs> so I'm going, to, I'm, going to make you, I'm going to make you a deal, okay? If I can lecture for about half of this time, then I really want to take the other half and see if we can't really interact and get responses to what I'm saying. So I want you to think about maybe one or two reactions you have to the material that I'm saying. It can be you agree, you disagree. It can be from your own life, from your own work. How does humility factor into what your experience is? And I really want you to do this, okay? I'm going. Uh, in the community, this is, in the Native American community, this is really valued, okay? So, see these gray hairs, okay? Uh, I might be considered, I am considered, an, an elder, okay? So, so, I'm going, I want you also, when you're thinking about your reactions, and I've, I've purposely taken some personal experiences that are older, because I want you to update it, just as you were doing your 30 seconds here. Okay, all right, so please think about that as I lecture at you at this first half, okay? Um, I wanna start out, whoa, get to do, do this. I wanna start out with, uh, I really, really think that humility gets a bad, bad rap. It gets a bad rap. It has the positive stereotype of being solely belonging to religious figures or to saints. It has the negative stereotype of being a weakness for losers. I don't feel humility in this way at all. For me and for my life experiences, humility is an approach, an approach to life that contrary to the public opinion requires, it requires a very strong ego. Not so simply, humility necessitates a lack of pretense. And that's actually a definition of humility I'd like to work with here in the lecture portion. A lack of pretense. The most recent research, and you better, you better thank Tess on your way out that a lot of this research got taken out. She'll tell you I had a ton of that stuff, okay? All right? The most recent research shows that humility, unlike its stereotypes, is often a characteristic of the most effective leaders and of the most innovative, creative people. The Ojibwe of Minnesota have understood the importance of humility for a long time. And as Carl told you, I came out of uh, 
the Native American studies out of anthropology. So uh, with you is the Ojibwe have a very, very long tradition of storytelling. And actually this morning I heard some of you talking about stories and how valuable they are to you. So kind of put that in your bag of thinking about things too, if you would, please. So I want to share some of my own life stories and some Ojibwe stories about why I think humility can be essential to a creative life. The Ojibwe have something called the circle of life, and I hope many of you know about that. People were a part of the circle of life, but so too were animals and birds and fish and even things that the Western conceptualization says are inanimate, things like mountains and rocks and rivers. They all had manitou or spirit, essence to them. And just as all points on a circle are equidistant, so all beings on the circle of life were different but equal. I learned the power of this when I first started teaching at MCAD. Early in my career at MCAD, and this is, this is like 1976, folks, okay, so you guys got to update, all right? This is long before the digital revolution, okay? There, there, there was no, there was no, there was even no Facebook, which is on its way out, right? Okay. Uh, there was, there, there wasn't chat rooms, there, 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 there wasn't, uh, dis, excuse me, discussion boards. So a number of students in a class of mine were complaining about one of the textbooks, it was to this, it was to that. Uh, it, was, it was, they were having a difficult time uh, understanding the material. I gave them chapter questions, they complained. I worked with chapters in small groups, they complained. I'd had it, they'd had it, okay? Then we set up something in that day we called reading circles, okay? Over lunch hours during the week prior to the next class, we would get together and informally go through paragraph by paragraph, if necessary, difficult areas in the coming class material as defined not by me, but by anybody in the circle, anybody who came, so that we were all just like the circle of life. We were all different but equidistant. We were all equal to one another and equally responsible for the material. Now, a funny thing started to happen, surprisingly, that these students actually became the leaders in class discussion as we went on in the semester. So I found out that by respecting and including the students more in a learning process, it could make me a better teacher and make the class much more productive. So first of all, to me, as the Ojibwe knew a long, long time ago with the circle of life, that humility necessitates an inclusiveness and a respect for others. For me, humility, I think, you need to be prepared to guide and to take charge when needed, but you also need to be aware of others' needs and strive to create the environment in which others are empowered. An attitude of humility helps develop different viewpoints that can multiply the power of problem solving and lead to innovative, creative breakthroughs. Surprisingly, this fostering of creativity is not only in others then, it's also in yourself. Uh, excuse me for a minute. While I was teaching at the University of Minnesota, we had an incident at a local hospital where an older Ojibwe woman had been hospitalized with an illness. While at the hospital, she began to stuff papers in her stockings, okay? And uh, she w developed uh, what the nursing staff thought was echolalia. And that's just like babbling nonsense syllables, like, kind of like I'm doing here, okay? Uh, ba babbling nonsense <laughs> syllables, all right? Now, one of the Ojibwe language students from the university was working at the hospital, and she heard the woman. The student thought that the older woman was speaking Ojibwe, so she reported this to the hospital staff. Now, once again, 
This is the 1970s, so, so you think updating, okay? If anything, the medical profession at that time was even more reviewed, revered than it is today. Yet the doctors and nurses involved with that elder Ojibwe woman's care had the lack of pretense, the humility, to call the newly developed Department of American Indian Studies at the University of Minnesota. So consequently, we were asked to intervene, and we were able to let the hospital know that that, uh, that, that woman was speaking Ojibwe, and it was her first language. We were also able to let the hospital know that when she was stuffing things in her stocking, that's what a lot of the elders from an older time period used to do, but to carry their money, okay? So, so since the 1990s, the work and the works of, I just have to include one a little bit of the research stuff, okay? Uh, <laughs> the, the research work of doctors Tervalo and Murray Garcia, they're, they're two doctors in the medical community in the 1990s, started talking about the concept of what they called cultural humility. That is, to be open to recognizing cultural power imbalances when necessary also to changing those power imbalances to create a new situation, okay? For that older Ojibwe woman years ago, it meant that she did not mistakenly get placed in a mental facility and she did get the pr proper treatment. In this elder Ojibwe woman's case, the people in power, the people in power, were willing to exhibit humility, a lack of pretense. They were willing to listen and even change positions of power. They didn't let their egos get in the way of problem solving. The Ojibwe have a process called talking sticks or talking circles, okay? And because this is sitting here and maybe we can use it later, okay, I'm just going talking stick. Oh, talking stick, okay. Uh, I'm going, the, the idea of talking stick was always, and it could be a really highly decorated, gorgeous, uh, but it was a symbol. Because when you had that, you were the one who was talking. And everyone else is listening, okay. And everyone, everyone who wanted to, got to speak, okay. And you went around, okay. Everybody got to speak at least once if they wanted to, okay? I'm not sure we can make that today, but well, I think we're gonna do some trying, okay? The idea, of, the idea of the talking stick was to encourage a respectful give and take and serve as the basis for engaging in attentive, and in the old days in, in clinical psych, we used to call this active listening. This is not just thinking about your ideas or what you want to say next, <laughs> which I'm doing right now, right? but focusing on the ideas and the arguments of the person who is talking. A lack of pretense is to be truly interested in listening to others, to really try to understand different points of view rather than just getting your own way in that meeting or enforcing your own point of view. To approach a situation with humility, I think, requires listening. And in turn, humility to listen can have enormous effects. So I wanted to tell you about kind of a, a hero of, of mine for a long time, seriously, uh, who I know you know, uh, a guy named Nelson Mandela. Uh, one of the big reasons Mandela was a hero of mine, and is a hero of mine, is because he took not his, not his ego, his own self-respect, but egotism, an inflated sense of his own self or his own power, out of the fight he had against apartheid. Mandela once said he thought humility, a lack of pretense, was one of the most important qualities for change. He purposely included in the South African Reconciliation Councils the concept of listening, attentive listening, in order to have all parties respect and include the other. He wasn't into just defeating the enemy, into just winning, but his action of humility, attentively listening to the other, was to create something totally new 
that would have lasting positive effects for all. And I, I won't do it, but I have this, I have a story about the crab war with the raccoons that come from, from the Ojibwe that I just love. If we have time later, we will, we will okay? As, as, Mandela, as Mandela certainly shows, humility is not about weakness. One more time. Humility is not about weakness. I think that humility means you strive to do the best you can, and you care, you care about doing the best you can. It also means, therefore, that you have to be open to admitting to and learning from your mistakes. Even competition, therefore, can be about developing humility. When competition is viewed not just about winning, but as a learning process. In regard to my own process of making mistakes, and some of you out here in the audience know me, please don't talk about all of them, okay? Uh, in, in regard to my own process of making mistakes and trying to learn from them, I, I hang on to two, they're kind of sports metaphors and kind of not, okay? Some of you know I love baseball, by the way, and one of them is a baseball, okay, all right. Um, the the first, first one here, I'll make it the baseball one, okay? I fell in love with a guy, I did, named Charles Albert Bender. Ugh. I even have, I even have, I do, I even have pictures of him in here, okay? Uh, he was, he was, uh, I, I did, by the way, I did uh, several years of historical research on him. Don't worry, it's okay with Tess, I'm not giving you any research on Bender, okay? All right? But I, I took a pilgrimage to the Baseball Hall of Fame. In fact, I took my sister along, I took my brother-in-law along. They got so tired of me doing research on Bender that they finally would just dump me off in the morning and they'd go out canoeing and biking and I got to be in the Hall of Fame. So while I was looking at the records in the Hall of Fame of some of the best players in baseball of all time, I was struck by a fact. In baseball, a 400 hitter would be not just great, he'd be fantastic, a 400 hitter. What that means is that you missed the ball, you, excuse me, you made a mistake, you made a mistake. Six times out of 10, the majority of the time, you failed, okay? Uh, but you're the height, the hero, okay? Uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame drove this home to me. When I make mistakes, it, that doesn't make me a failure. When I make mistakes, it doesn't make me a failure. As long as I recognize and learn from those mistakes. And I really do try to keep that attitude with me. <laughs> and I'm, I'm teasing in my own head going, well, I'll try to keep that with me when I walk out of here today. Um, an attitude of humility allows us to admit our mistakes and use them as what I call teachable learning moments. And once again, from the Ojibwe, the Ojibwe have a, a word, gekunin, excuse me, and one time, I was taking an Ojibwe elder uh, to, to do a, a guest lecture. Uh, she lived in St. Paul, and I was taking over here to MCAD in Minneapolis. And this word, Gekunin, by the way, it's teaching and it's learning. It's everything in one package. It's, a, it's all of it, okay? And it goes on forever. The, the elder that I was bringing over here just on that little ways from St. Paul to Minneapolis, she gave me over a hundred verb forms for it in Ojibwe. It was like a game we were playing on the way over here. Uh, I'm going, uh, it's, Gekunin, it's, it's a lifelong learning process in terms of how the Ojibwe people view it, okay? So when I make mistakes, Gekunin, it can be a lifelong learning process uh, and I'm, I'm still learning a lot here, okay. My second, my second kind of, kind of, kind of not sports story, uh, I don't know, oh, did any of you, did any of you fill out a March Madness bracket? <laughs> okay, all right, <clears throat> okay. I'm going, if you, if you did, you really understand this one, okay. I'm going, uh, for years of my growing up, uh, a guy, a coach named John Wooden coached for UCLA. 
and UCLA basketball dominated uh, during March Madness, okay? So I grew up rather, not rather, I really disliked UCLA basketball, okay? But there was something I learned from John Wooden. He said there's a difference between winning and succeeding. There's a difference between winning and succeeding. Now, I grew up in Wisconsin. Packer land for any of you Wisconsinites out there, you know it. Okay, yeah, I see head shakes already. Okay, it's the land of Vince Lombardi, right? And everybody thinks he said this, but he didn't, right? I'm going, uh, winning isn't everything, it's the only thing, right? But he really never said that. <laughs> um, so it took some life experiences and many mistakes for me to understand Wooden's ideas that winning and succeeding were different. Winning and succeeding were different. Wooden had this pyramid of success, and he said you got to the peak of success by not making excuses, and always, always, Gekinen, always, always learning from others. But the top of Wooden's pyramid wasn't winning. The top of the pyramid, it's not winning, the Wooden, and he dominated, okay? It wasn't winning, he said it was faith and patience, faith and patience. That floored me. What the heck was he talking about? Uh, you know, what's he talking about? The top of his success pyramid is faith and patience? Give me a break, you know? Well, <clears throat> after, me, after starting graduate school at the U of M, I learned a little bit of what Wooden meant. I had one anthropology course in undergraduate school, but I wanted to study Native American cultures so at the time, anthropology was the only way you could do that. So I got into the University of Minnesota, and one of my fellow graduate students had studied anthropology at the Sorbonne in Paris. Okay. She could read, I, I, I don't know if anybody still knows who this is, but she could read Claude Lévi-Strauss. She could read Claude Lévi-Strauss in the original French. I could barely understand him in English. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> to say I was intimidated is an understatement, but luckily I did know enough by that time to know that here was a person I could learn from. So at the first grad party, this is really true, at the first grad party, I got up my courage and I introduced myself. At some point in our talking, she asked me if I spoke Indian. Aha, I hear laughter out there. Good, good. Because most of you know that there's many, many, many Native American languages, okay? There's no such thing as speaking Indian, all right? So uh, her question left me, catch this, it left me speechless for a while, it really did. I remember just standing there looking at her going, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> in, honest, in honest, critical, no excuses self-reflection, I still needed to spend three times the amount of study on Levi-Strauss than uh, she did. And I certainly needed more background in anthropology but I also needed to believe in myself. I needed to believe in my own ability. It taught me pretty quickly that having faith, a belief in yourself and in what others have to give, and making the effort and the time or patience to develop, to grow, is fundamental to success. Good old John Wooden, okay? Part of the attitude of humility to me is therefore a belief in yourself, not arrogance or egotism, but a strong ego coupled with a dedication to the process of lifelong learning. It allows us to be self-reflective and to, to be committed to our own growth and to the growth of others. Someone essential to my own growth was a woman named Rose Barstow. She was an Ojibwe language instructor at the University of Minnesota many years ago. Since the elders will usually tell you stories that they feel you need, and the stories are kind of like uh, Aesop's fables is the uh, metaphor I use, I'm going, uh, where there's always kind of a moral to the story, and they'll keep telling you the stories until you get the moral. Okay, so uh, Rose would always be telling me stories about patience. I don't know why I needed that, okay? Uh, 
but story after story, uh, and I really, <laughs> trust me, I, re I really didn't get it. At one point, however, I was told about a process in, in Ojibwe beading, and I call it the, the misplaced bead, okay? Um, and actually, I, I'm feeling it in my pocket right now. I should probably take it out. I'm going, uh, it, you, can, you can try this later if you want to. I'm going, I just brought, I, I just pulled this out of, of my drawer. I'm just going, uh, any medallion. I'm going, in the old beading style, find the misplaced bead. It's a different color. It's a different part of the pattern. It's misplaced, okay? And that's a symbol in beading. It's a symbol. I use the, the, Greek concept, the Greek concept of hubris. You don't get above the powers that be, OK? Humility, OK? And, and for me, the misplaced bead. The misplaced bead finally got it. I, it, I mean, I finally got it because of the misplaced bead. Uh, it's not a mistake. It's not even a mistake. It's a symbol that I'm not always in control. That sometimes not having everything perfect has value. And sometimes not doing was doing. Now, if that sounds kind of zen, yeah, sounds kind of zen, doesn't it? Okay. The, Oje excuse me, the Ojibwe beaters understood their art requires humility, acceptance, and patience. They understood Coach Wooden's sports metaphor of faith and patience as the pinnacle of success long, long before I did. Recent research confirms, and once again, you're not getting it, double thanks to Tess again, okay? <laughs> Recent research confirms that many creative leaders don't feel the need to control everything. They accept ambiguity, they accept differences. Paradoxic paradoxically, through this acceptance comes new possibilities. Not always controlling everything has creative power. And there's, there's two stories I want in here, and that is I'm back to uh, Derek introducing me. I'm going, I got over to MCAD because of a lack of control I had. I was over at the University of Minnesota. I was the youngest of the instructors over there. I'm up and coming, yeah, right, okay. Uh, and the newly developed uh, Department of American Indian Studies got a phone call from someplace called the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. And they said, we've got 17 students coming up from the Institute of American Indian Arts down in Santa Fe, and we don't know what to do. Okay. Uh, Great, I, I'm not just doing this as a, as a paid political announcement for a past employer, but wonderful, hum, seriously wonderful humility on the part of, of some people over at MCAT to call up and, and ask for some help in developing a program uh, for those students. And one of the things that they wanted was a course. We want a course, okay? Well, they want that course at 8.15 in the morning, okay? I'm the youngest person on staff, remember, over at the University of Minnesota, okay? And the call comes in, no offense to MCATers out here, okay? Nobody wanted to go at 8.15 in the morning, okay? All right? So, of course, who, I got sent, right? I literally got sent, no control, okay? Uh, so I get over here in uh, next door here, and I really did. I found a whole, a whole new pathway, and uh, it opened up so much for me in my life. Uh, Thirty-eight years worth. Okay, so, so that's my first story about uh, kind of the lack of control. My uh, next story is I want to introduce you to, and I hope I can do, do it justice. I want to introduce you to uh, the uh, Ojibwe creation story, if you haven't heard it, OK? And I'll try to do a fairly decent job. And I'm going to have to uh, kind of attenu attenuate it because it's very long, OK? So I'm going, OK. Long ago, the Anishinaabe began to argue and fight with one another, seeing that harmony and respect for all living things no longer prevailed on Earth. The great spirit, Gichimonitu, decided to purify Earth. And he did this with water in the form of a great flood. Culture hero, and oh please, oh please, 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 keep me saying culture hero 
rather than Culture Hero's name, because you know what the, the weather was early this morning here, and what they're still saying we might get a little bit of, okay? The, the story with Culture Hero's name is always that he was part of the Winter Lodge Tales of the Anishinaabe people, and so you'll always, you'd only say his name in winter if you didn't want it to, you know, that white fluffy, hopefully still fluffy, stuff coming down, okay? So I'll try not to say his name, please. Help me, okay? Uh, Culture Hero was able to survive the flood along with a few animals and birds, and they floated on a huge log searching for land. Culture Hero spoke, I'm going to swim to the bottom of this water and grab a handful of earth, and with this bit of earth, I believe we can create a new land for us to live on with the help of the four winds and get your monitor. So he dove into the water and was gone for a long, long time. Finally, he surfaced and short of breath told the animals that the water is too deep for him to swim to the bottom. Everybody was silent for a very, very long time. Finally, Loon spoke up. Beautiful, gorgeous Loon, okay? And he said, I can dive under the water for a long way. That's how I catch my food. I'll try to make it to the bottom and return with some earth in my beak. The loon disappeared and was gone for a long time. Finally, he came back to the surface, weak, nearly unconscious. He gasped. I couldn't make it. There's no bottom to this water. Uh, and he, he just, he couldn't do it. He fell over, okay? Then the hell diver, you know, some of you not so strong duck, okay? I'm going, the hell diver came forward. I'll try next. I can d dive great distances. Again, after a very long time, he too floated to the surface, unconscious, unable to get a piece of the earth from the bottom. And then all sorts of animals, that's, I'm now cutting here, okay? All sorts of animals try, okay? And they can't do it. So finally, this little voice is heard, this soft, the soft little voice. And it says, I, I, can, I can do it. I can do it. And... People are looking, the, the other animals are looking around going, who is that? They don't even see who, they don't, don't even see who it is. And finally, little muskrat steps up. Have you ever seen a muskrat? You, you, you'll know humility, okay? Uh, <laughs> muskrat says, I'll try, I'll try. Some of the bigger, more powerful animals even laugh, even laugh at muskrat. Then culture hero speaks up. Only Gichimonitu, the great spirit, can place judgment on others. If Muskrat wants to try, he should be allowed to try. So Muskrat dove into the water. He was gone much longer than any of the others who tried to reach the bottom. Far below the water's surface, Muskrat had in fact reached the bottom. Very weak from lack of air, he grabbed some earth in his paw, and with all the energy he could muster, he began to swim for the surface. One of the animals finally spots Muskrat as he floats up above the surface. Now, in some versions of this story, Muskrat actually sacrifices his life. In others, he doesn't, but, uh, but he's, we, we all know now he's got that in his paw, right? Okay. So Culture Hero exclaims, look, there's something in his paw. Culture Hero carefully opens the tiny Muskrat paw and all the animals gather close to see what was held so tightly there. Muskrat's paw opened and revealed a small ball of earth. The animals all shouted with joy. Life on earth could start anew. Okay, and it goes on. Turtle takes the ball on his back and the, and the four directions winds blow and Gichimonitu blesses it and uh, Turtle Island is born, and that's North America, okay? So the entire world is formed in this way, according to uh, the Anish pardon me, Anishinaabe people. Uh, so I want to I want to say two things that kind of, in humility, the Ojibwe have the creation of all, of all things, okay? And I really, I really do think they see this as very, very, powerful. And I want to give you one last thing. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it before because I used it in the blurb here. I'm going, this is C.S. Lewis, a little humanities, okay? C.S. Lewis. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Okay?